What's up guys? Welcome back to the channel. Today we're doing some more Tales from Tech Support, so uh, sit back, relax, and enjoy. I don't know if you can see this, but right behind me here is our dog Sophie, who is some kind of Carolina dog mix, and Dimey, the black cat, the tuxedo cat, is just on the other side of her, messing with her. She keeps He keeps sniffing her tail and she gets a little weirded out by it. Right, Sophie? There she is. <laughs> yep. We got some good animals here, for the most part. Customer doesn't understand the difference between an HDD and an SSD, hard disk drive and a solid state drive. Okay, so this is my first story here, and English is not my first language, so please keep that in mind. Also, this is probably going to be one of many stories over the next years, as I'm working basically in the tech support industry. I work for a fairly old company that's been building and configuring servers for customers all over Europe and even a few across the globe in China and USA and the likes. One of our products is a standard server chassis with hardware tailored to the customer's needs with motherboard, CPU, NIC, and any add-on cards the customer needs. This customer bought a fairly standard server, not really anything special, motherboard or crazy CPU and just a network card and a storage controller as an add-on card. We shipped it out to the customer about a year or two ago. All was working fine with a few SSDs installed in the 12 SSD slash HDD slots. Operating system already installed. Now there were still a few empty slots left so we kept the trays for installing additional 3.5 inch hard drives in the chassis as per company policy. Now on to the not so experienced customer who had bought an additional hard drive. Yes, you heard that right, a hard disk drive, which although not much are still slower than SSDs. Now as I said before, we installed SSDs per the customer's orders. All items are put in an invoice which is sent to the customer for approval and final go for the order. So the customer knew full well what they were getting. Now a couple weeks ago our support team gets a ticket stating that one of their drives in the server is substantially slower than the others and they can't work like this and whatnot. So after about 20 emails back and forth and the email chain growing and growing with pauses in between because of vacations and sicknesses on their side, we finally get to the point where my colleague has no more ideas and decides, you know what, there's nothing wrong with the server but the IT guy from their company won't believe or accept that. So we go ahead and build a complete copy of their server. They swap the SSDs and the HDD and send us back the faulty server. After some time and the email chain growing to about 70 emails, which is a hassle to read through in order to find out what exactly the problem was in the first place, we get the server. I'm tasked with testing it by basically letting it run under full load and testing several drive slots at the same time to see if anything's broken or has any errors. And by full load, I mean full load. That server was running for several days under 100% CPU, 100% RAM, and maximum performance each disk could achieve. And no issues, no errors, or any sudden reboots or slower speeds, even under highly unlikely 100% CPU load. So now we have spent our time and effort fixing a non-existent problem. Afterwards, I then found out through my colleague that the customer installed the hard disk drive and that they had a talk about the slower speeds of hard disk drives and that it's likely the problem the IT guy from the other company was reporting. But he was too shy or embarrassed to admit via email or on the phone with my colleague. Here's some needed context for the story. The server we're talking about cost them about 10,000, is it 10,000 plus? about 5,000 euro in service fees for our support and advanced replacement if needed. We on the other hand could buy these parts at about 7.5 euro or 7,500 euro. So we still made money but it's way less whenever something has to be replaced because we can't sell these parts as new. We can only keep them in our stock, mark them as service and send them out once somebody needs a warranty replacement or an advanced replacement. It took me a long time when I first started messing with computers. Now, I'm not I'm not trained as a tech person. You guys probably know this just by the way I read the stories. But it took me a long time to figure out that even before solid state drives were a thing, that there were different grades of hard disk drives, you know, different RPM platters and things like that, read and write speed and I whatever. Uh, and then when solid drives came along, I ended up actually, my first solid state drive that I bought was an internal for one of my PCs. And it actually ended up being slower than one of my old hard drives for some reason. I guess I just didn't read the specs and, you know, assume because it's solid state, it was going to, of course, be faster. Well, that's not always the case, evidently, or at least early on it wasn't. I don't know about now. The ones I buy now do just fine for me. I mean, shoot, I've even got, I've even still got some of these my books around the uh, Western Digital My Books. Uh, each one of these is a terabyte. I think I've got four terabytes worth of these sitting around. So 
Yeah. And they're slow, but they work. They work over USB, so it is what it is. They're great for long-term storage as long as uh, the cats don't knock them over or piss on them or whatever. So, <laughs> anyway. Internship, Dota, and old school data mining. I'm hoping that says Dota. This was years ago. I was in my final stretch of the bachelor's degree and had to do an internship for a semester to graduate. I looked around, but in the end, I decided to just do it at the local internet cafe I was hanging out at. I knew the owner. I had spent a considerable amount of time there, so it seemed like the easiest path. The owner, M, had two guys for IT support, but they were working remotely. They had the PCs almost automated, loading a prepared image when needed or on each boot, and they would come down every three months for some checks. So I thought I could learn from them. They always seemed cool. And he needed someone a little more technically capable than the current employees. I would do the usual, make coffee and tend to the register, but also help customers or repair hardware when needed so that he wouldn't have to ship it to the repair of IT guys. Everything was peachy. Besides the usual creeps and some GPUs that were failing, managed to fix some of them by putting them in the oven, having found an article about it, it was excellent. I worked nights, which was quiet, and just counted the days to the end of the internship so I could go and find a real job. At some point, about two months into my internship, things started happening. It was at a time where there was no reconnecting to an online game, not most of them anyway, and Dota was popular, like the actual Warcraft 3 map, so customers were rightly pissed when the connections started dropping like flies. They would play and then nothing, network would drop them. The IT guys immediately said we needed to change the switch in the server rack room, more like a rack closet. But that was expensive and not a guaranteed solution, so the boss stonewalled until the customers threatened to leave and go elsewhere. He tasked me to find one online which I got from eBay for half the price. It was shipped, received, and the guys guided me on the phone on installing it. For a few days it was okay until the issue returned, and I had limited experience so I did my best. Went online, tried several things, but nothing. It went on for a couple weeks more until I had an idea to do some data mining. Nothing much, but I just started writing down details about when the disconnections happened. Soon it became apparent to me that it only happened when there were more than a number of customers in the shop. About 20 or so, but it wasn't an exact number. I did some research and found a setting on the network card for each computer. They were loading an image, remember? Related to high stress or something. I can't recall the name or where it was, but essentially when the network reached a certain bandwidth, it shut down the LAN port. It was just a bloody checkbox. The IT guys fixed it, repaired the images as well with the new setting, and we all went on to playing Dota like nobody's business. But I still use it in some interviews when asked how I handle problems. Excuse the formatting and grammar. I wrote this while waiting for a train on my phone. Well, OP, there was nothing wrong with your grammar, formatting, or otherwise. My, uh, in fact, my limited English and grammatical skills were, uh, hardly put to the test reading this story. It was mostly just my flub ups. So good on you, man. I love it when there are certain problems and the supposed experts can't figure out what it is. Now being remote makes it a little tougher. I'll give them that. But I used to hang out with a buddy of mine who owned a mechanic shop up the street. And when I was working for the public school system, when it snowed deep, we had days off. So there was one bad snowstorm. I don't know. This is probably about 10, 12 years ago. And we ended up with like four or five days off in a row because, you know, when it snows more than six inches here, the whole town seems to shut down. But anyway, so I was hanging out in his shop and I had a transmission shifting issue and it had happened before. And the shop that I went to before that just replaced the transmission. So that told me right there that they weren't really diagnosticians. They weren't like what I would call a mechanic. To me, a mechanic is a guy who will say, okay, this did this. Usually we just replace the parts, you know, we call them part swappers and I, I'm a part swapper. Don't get me wrong. I'm a carpenter. I'm not a mechanic, but you know, I do like to try to troubleshoot things to get to the root cause. And, uh, I started doing some Googling cause I didn't want to pay for another transmission for this. It was a, uh, Plymouth Voyager minivan and uh, great running van. I used it like a pickup truck. We hauled the kids up and down the East Coast with it. I mean, I love this van. So anyway, I'm sitting there bored out of my mind, sitting in his shop. And I got on one of his computers and started Googling, you know, transmission shifting issues for a 1998 Plymouth Grand Voyager, blah, blah, blah. And uh, come to find out, one of the first things that came up on Google was talking about there are essentially... I may be getting this wrong. There's either two or three shift sensors. So basically they bolt into the side of the transmission and there's like a little, almost like a little screen or an eye of some sort that senses speeds of things, RPMs of things, whatever, and tells the 
car, it's an electronic shift, tells the car when to shift to the next gear. And uh, there's multiples, but it said most likely when this starts happening, you know, your van won't shift above a certain gear or go above a certain speed. It's usually this one sensor. So I asked the mechanic, one of the mechanics, when he came into the office from the shop, if he knew what I was talking about. And he says, not really. He says, but I do know where that particular sensor is that you're talking about. He went and got it out. He pulled it out and he, we both looked at it standing in the office and the thing was burnt to a crisp. Well, evidently when you put a, like a, a Jasper transmission into the van, it's a, which is a rebuilt transmission, you don't change any of those sensors or things that plug into the transmission. You're just putting the transmission in and then hooking everything back up. Makes sense under most circumstances, but you would think, you know, shift sensor, you would think that's something that they would look at at least while it was off. You know, when I take bolts out of things, I look at them. Are they, have they been cross-threaded? Are they are they mashed? Have they been over-torqued? Eh. So anyway, the part cost like 35 bucks, and it was going to be like another 35 or 40 bucks for a half hour's worth of labor. He wasn't even going to charge me the full minimum hour. And uh, he swapped the parts out. The van shifted like a dream. Never did go out again after that. And the guy didn't even end up charging me. I, I ended up doing some odds and ends for him around the shop, helping with customers and fielding phone calls because I, you know, I don't feel right if I don't at least give something for getting something. So, you know, anyway, long winded as that was, uh, just goes to show you that sometimes the experts aren't really all that expert. Sometimes Google's more expert than they are. A Unix core by any other name. Back in the 1900s, I worked tech support for a software company in Northern California. Being on the West Coast, there was always one lucky person who's opened early for the Eastern Seaboard. That would be this monkey. One early Tuesday, I opened the phones and my first call of the day was in a panic. My software stopped working. As you and I all know, things just don't stop working. We can figure out how to fix whatever you did, but you have to be honest with me. We started with the basics. Kill and restart the license demon. Damon. Bleh. Okay, yes, the right program's working. Great, check the other two in your bundle, please. It's no good, I can't get into the draw operation. Okay, could be a corrupt file. Let's recreate your license and I'll email it. Lucky me also got to explain to a systems administrator how to kill a process. I did not ask how long they'd been doing the work. My new friend moved the old license to old and replaced the new file in its slot. Restart the license, Damon. Am I saying that right? I, I want to say Damon, anyway. And let's try those programs again. Oh my God, the writing program isn't working. Okay, I've already asked twice, but I ask again. Have you made any changes to the system before this stopped working? I get heaving silence on the other end for a moment. The sysadmin finally says, I'm done with you. And he hangs up. Less than 10 minutes later, another tech calls me. My friend escalated her issue, oh, her, to her manager. Okay, I'm a professional. I review the call, just in case, and pick up the tirade from a woman who is pretty angry that I would dare question her people. Yes, ma'am, I'm happy to try and resolve this. If you can tell me what changes were made to the system, we can... We haven't made any effing changes to the effing system. Okay, so we can try removing and reinstall... No, this is not our effing problem. I want someone to fix this now. So, time to bring in my boss. I have no idea what happened on the call. My boss came a few minutes, 30 minutes, later and said, we're flying the head of QA out. I can't find anything wrong from how you've handled it, so we're going in person. Wednesday morning, I opened the phones. Less than 40 seconds later, the head of QA is on the phone with me. Did you suggest reinstall? Yes, well, I tried to. Did you ask what they changed? Yes, they said nothing changed on the system. I sent her a new license file, restart the LM, and yep, paint program isn't working this time. QA says, let me dig around. I'll call you back. Sometime just before my 10.30 lunch, QA called back. She's obviously trying not to laugh, so I'm reinstalling the entire program. Apparently, Monday night they rebuilt the core and removed a bunch of hardware initialization they weren't using. But they said they hadn't made any changes to the system. Well, obviously the core isn't part of the system. I love it when people just outright lie or they don't know enough about anything that they're doing with their job to know that they've made a mistake. I don't know. I find that most of the time it's people just lying, but there are times when people just don't know anything about the, the deeper processes and what they're doing and they end up screwing something up and they have no idea that they actually did it. They thought they were getting rid of something useless and I don't know, just makes me nuts. Can't be arsed to open a ticket for their work stopping issue. My team works from a ticketing queue, supporting a subset of the systems at my company. We don't accept work requests via phone call, email, IMs, walkups. 
If you need to engage us, you open a ticket via any number of means which are unimportant for this story. Of course, we also have a group inbox, but again, no ticket, no work. Two days ago, we got an email to the group inbox. Hey, we can't save files. And there's a screenshot of access denied error message. Can you please grant this list of ID access? No mention of where these files are located, and my team isn't in the business of granting access to anything. But if we did have a ticket with some info about where these files were, we could route it to the right people. So in a slack moment, I reply, you haven't included any information at all about the host or the path where these files are located, so I don't have any way to put you in touch with the right team. If you put that info into a ticket to my queue, I can put it in front of the right people. But as is, I don't have enough information to help you at all. The client sends an email with the host name and file share path, so I reply again, great, thank you. Now please put all that into a ticket as I mentioned, and I'll assign it to the team that can help you. Nothing. Crickets. What they want is deep into some other group's territory, and I would be stepping all over that group's toes and breaking all kinds of protocol if I did what they asked. It's possible, unlikely but possible, that I could even lose my job if I did what they say they need. I know the group that can help. I asked twice for a ticket so I could help them. They just can't be arsed to spend two minutes creating a ticket. I'm convinced they just want to say, we asked but nobody would help us. I've never understood. There's a, there's a general laziness in us as humans. And I see it every day in different circumstances. You know, it really doesn't take much longer, if longer at all, to do things properly. You know, I stop at a red light and the the right lane in this instance that I'm thinking about is also the right, the, it's the right turn lane and the straight through the intersection lane. No problem. Well, there's a old gas station that's now defunct and closed down because it got bought out by a bigger chain, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the driveways are still there. And what they'll do is they'll, people will come up and if they're anywhere near that driveway, they will cut that corner across and jump out onto the other road, which is not legal in most states, by the way. If you don't know that already, look it up because it's not legal. You will get a ticket for that. Uh, so anyway, now if you pull in, pull up to a pump and then say, oh, I forgot whatever and pull away or pull into a parking spot and then back out, pull away. That's something completely different, but just darting through totally illegal. Uh, but yeah, people do stuff like that all the time. Like really would it have been that bad if you just waited the extra 30 seconds for the light to finish changing? I mean, come on. That's just like people waiting to make a left across a highway. We had this one, and I call it a highway. It's just a four lane road with a center turn lane that goes through the middle of our town. And, uh, you know, people will sit in the driveway of a business wanting to make a left across that whole mess instead of just either making a quick right and going around the block making all right turns or making a right changing lanes gradually to get to the turn lane and making the next left i mean or yui there's a way you can make a yui up there but you know people just they think they're taking shortcuts and whatever and it just doesn't work i just don't know what would possess people to want to make a left can turn across at least three lanes of traffic but whatever time traveling sis admins powers no ma'am it doesn't work that way in another episode of The Wayback Machine, we travel back to my baby geek era of the early 2000s. In this chapter, I'm responsible for the miscellaneous collection of things all new tech support folks inherit, including troubleshooting our fancy new payroll system. We've recently upgraded from green screens to a browser-based system that is proceeding to absolutely baffle our payroll team with its high-tech interface. The morning begins far too early, as they all do, and I can hear my phone ringing as I'm plodding towards my desk with my first cup of coffee. Caller ID shows that it's our payroll director, so I know it's going to be a long day. I put on my best cheerful customer service voice and asked her how I can help this morning. She explains she's having trouble getting the payroll report to balance. This is a payroll system. They're all payroll reports. So we go back and forth until I finally tell her to fax me the page that's wrong with the error circled and I'll figure it out. Yes, we had email, but getting her to scan and attach a green bar report was not going to happen at 9am. She understood the fax machine. Shortly after, I hear the fax machine chatter to life and head over to see what tales it has for me today. At this point in our story, it's pretty ordinary. The printout has what I needed to find in the report, and the error doesn't take too long to find and fix for her. Triumphant, I call her back and explain the issue I fixed and let her know it should balance on her next run. I go back to my coffee, content with my day so far. Within about 15 minutes, my phone rings again and I see it's her calling. When I answer, I'm met with indignant yelling about how the report still doesn't balance and I didn't do what I said, and blah blah blah. The minute she said it still didn't bounce, my spidey senses started tingling, but I hadn't quite figured out why just yet. 
Eventually, she ends her rant with a breathless exclamation that it didn't change anything. Insert comic strip light bulb meme here. What set off my bullshit detector was the timing. Remember, this is the pre Wi Fi era. Even an on premises browser platform took a while to do things. That set of reports took a good 35 to 40 minutes to fully execute. It hasn't been that long. There's no way she's rerun them. With some trepidation, I gently asked her to help me understand what she was seeing. What was she looking at that told her the numbers hadn't updated? She does technically make sure I get paid on time, so I don't want to be too rude. 20 plus years later, I can still almost hear her yell echoing in my ears. My printout didn't change. When I told her the system error was fixed, she reopened the exact same copy of the report she had already without actually telling it to recalculate. When I pointed out the timestamp was from before I told her it was fixed, she said she didn't care and that I should have updated it anyway. No ma'am, I can't rewind time for you. You're going to have to actually run the report again. Yes, really. No, I can't run it for you. Oh my gosh, what do you even say about that? <laughs> so, I have one time, my wife asked me to make some changes to her website for her. No problem. I go in, I make the changes, you know, the necessary changes. I hit publish and then I, you know, refresh my browser to make sure that the published content actually came through. Then I told her it was done. Went on with what I was doing, probably setting up one of these videos and, you know, life was good. Until she came stomping in or yelling from the other room, whatever it was, and saying, it's not changed. You didn't add what I asked to the website. And I said, did you already have it open when you asked me to make the changes in your, you know, browser? Yes. I said, did you refresh your browser? Like, did you refresh the page before you told me this? No. I said, go back and refresh your browser. She, gets, she goes back, refreshes her browser, and all is right with the world. It's all there. So, I don't know. It's hard to get people to understand that you have to refresh the browser sometimes. And I guess a lot of programs are that way, too. What are you going to do? All right, guys. Thanks for joining me today. Hope you enjoyed the stories. And if you did, do me a favor. Click all those little buttons down there and see what they do. All right. Till the next one. We'll see you.